Thank you so much, uh, extra credit seekers and, <laughs> and professors who are giving the extra credit. Thank you for, for coming tonight. Um, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I'm assuming that you know a little bit about uh, William Shakespeare. He's the one on the left. <laughs> and maybe even less about Steve Jobs. But that's, uh, those are the people that we're going to be discussing tonight. And the reason I want to talk about Shakespeare and Steve Jobs, the reason I chose those two was because they're both creative people, I think you'll agree, creative geniuses perhaps, but they're very different. And I thought maybe we could find out something about creative genius by taking a look at the similarities and differences between these two individuals and perhaps even find something that we mere mortals can use to be a little bit more creative and genius-like ourselves. I'm going to give you uh, now, oh, the uh, title was, if you'll recall, Shakespeare, Steve Jobs, and Me. And I didn't mean to elevate myself to that level, but um, I'm just here to kind of help you connect the dots between Shakespeare and Steve Jobs. And that will be kind of my mantra this evening is connecting the dots, as you will see as, as we go along. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief executive three-point summary of my talk. And those of you that are still deciding on whether you want to do this or something else, then you'll be able to see whether you want to stay for the next uh, four hour, oh, excuse me, for the next hour, hour and a half. Um, the argument that I'm going to make is as follows, that creative ideas are rare be precisely because they come from unusual and unexpected places. And the people we call creative are receptive to those ideas because they have two psychological characteristics in common. One is that they have what we psychologists call openness to experience. If you're a psychology student, you've probably heard that phrase before. And the other one is that they have a certain amount of intelligence. But the thing I find interesting is that their pattern of intelligence is a little different. Shakespeare's uh, pattern of intelligence is different from Steve Jobs in particular. But as they say in infomercials, that's not all. It seems to me that creativity occurs in a cultural context. And I'm going to argue that it takes a certain amount of cultural upheaval to bring creative, creativity out of creative people. And the good news is, if you've watched the news recently, we have a certain amount of cultural upheaval, so the time is ripe for you. So anyway, that's where we're going. Anybody want to leave? Just a few in the back. Okay. Oh, I should say that I'm going to give Steve Jobs relatively short shrift because I have a hidden agenda, part of which is to convince people who are maybe not big Shakespeare fans Susie Horton, where are you? Uh, we need her in here because I really want to convince her that Shakespeare had something to say about psychology <laughs> that, uh, that's, well, pretty interesting, but I'll unveil that in a, in a little bit. Uh, so now I want to see what I'm up against. How many of you are psychology students? Would you raise your hand? Okay, that looks like a majority. How many are psychology professors? A few, and they're hanging out in the lobby, I guess. Uh, how many are English teachers? Do we have any English? Oh, okay, I'm in trouble now. 
because I am not a Shakespeare expert. My training is in psychology, and I'm merely posing as a Shakespeare expert tonight. So uh, if you have any questions, there will be uh, time for questions at the end. Uh, make them softball questions, would you please? Or, or correct me gently if I make an error about Shakespeare. Uh, how many of you have either read or seen one of Shakespeare's plays? Would you raise your hand? Oh, that's, that's great. Okay, amazing. Anybody read 10 of them? English teacher? Oh, good. Now I'm really in trouble. All right, so let's begin with the easy one of this pair, and we'll start with Steve Jobs. Can you give me some information? I, what do you know about this guy? Uh, holler out something. Apple, Apple computers. <laughs> what? He's dead. Oh, he's dead. He's dead. He's really, and so is Shakespeare, incidentally. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Steve Jobs died in 2011, didn't he? I think it was, that was when it was. Um, he invented the iPhone and the iPad. And I have a PC, thank you very much. But uh, Anything else you know about him? I've got just a few facts. Start Pixar. He started Pixar when he got fired from... Um, Apple, and he was later rehired, but he uh, either started or bought, I think he bought Pixar, wasn't that it? And took it to a new level and then came back and rescued uh, Apple computers. Uh, here's his uh, partner, Steve Wozniak, and they met it when Steve Jobs was in high school and invented the Macintosh. Uh, here you see the first uh, computer that they put together, and it was the first time anybody had ever combined a monitor and a computer itself and a keyboard. You know, a creative idea, I would submit to you. I'd like to have, you, uh, have Steve Jobs tell you just a little bit about himself. If you've, um, how many have heard the uh, Stanford commencement address? Anybody heard his famous, okay, you can sleep for a little while. I'm gonna play just a, a short segment of it. It's a three part um, speech that went viral on YouTube and you can watch that later, the rest of it. So right now, we'll just look at the first two. Thank you. I'm uh, honored to be with you today for your commencement from one of the finest universities in the world. <sighs> Truth be told, uh, I never graduated from college, and uh, this is the closest I've ever gotten to a college graduation. <laughs> today, I want to tell you three stories from my life. That's it, no big deal, just three stories. The first story is about connecting the dots. I dropped out of Reed College after the first six months, but then stayed around as a drop-in for another 18 months or so before I really quit. So why'd I drop out? It started before I was born. My biological mother was a young, unwed graduate student, and she decided to put me up for adoption. She felt very strongly that I should be adopted by college graduates, so everything was all set for me to be adopted at birth by a lawyer and his wife. Except that when I popped out, they decided at the last minute that they really wanted a girl. So my parents, who were on a waiting list, got a call in the middle of the night asking, we've got an unexpected baby boy, do you want him? They said, of course. My biological mother found out later that my mother had never graduated from college and that my father had never graduated from high school. She refused to sign the final adoption papers 
She only relented a few months later when my parents promised that I would go to college. This was the start in my life. And 17 years later, I did go to college. But I naively chose a college that was almost as expensive as Stanford. And all of my working class parents' savings were being spent on my college tuition. After six months, I couldn't see the value in it. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was, spending all the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work out okay. It was pretty scary at the time, but looking back, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. <laughs> the minute I dropped out, I could stop taking the required classes that didn't interest me and begin dropping in on the ones that looked far more interesting. It wasn't all romantic. I didn't have a dorm room, so I slept on the floor in friends' rooms. I returned Coke bottles for the five cent deposits to buy food with. And I would walk the seven miles across town every Sunday night to get one good meal a week at the Hare Krishna temple. I loved it. And much of what I stumbled into by following my curiosity and intuition turned out to be priceless later on. Let me give you one example. Reed College at that time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Throughout the campus, every poster, every label on every drawer was beautifully hand calligraphed. Because I had dropped out and didn't have to take the normal classes, I decided to take a calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif typefaces, about varying the amount of space between different letter combinations, about what makes great typography great. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that science can't capture, and I found it fascinating. None of this had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me. And we designed it all into the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never dropped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. And since Windows just copied the Mac, it's likely that no personal computer would have them. If I had never dropped out, I would have never dropped in on that calligraphy class, and personal computers might not have the wonderful typography that they do. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards ten years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. You can watch the rest of it again on YouTube at any time. Not now. So what do I want you to remember from that? Two things. One is his is the part about his calligraphy class and how hard it is to connect the dots. And the second thing is his eagerness to explore new and interesting ideas after he dropped out of regular classes. I mentioned his uh, openness to experience that I think he and Shakespeare shared. And those of you who are psychology students probably remember that from the five-factor theory uh, that is sometimes called the, the big five. For those of you who are not psychology students, uh, you might um, want to know that the five-factor theory involves five personality traits that seem to be universal in um, many cultures around the world. And the one that uh, we're most in interested in tonight is openness to experience. 
Uh, but the other, were, other ones, just for your information, are conscientiousness, uh, extroversion, introversion, agreeableness, which, uh, according to his bio, uh, biographer, is not one that Steve Jobs was always high on, and neuroticism, and maybe you know somebody like that. It turns out that openness to experience is the only uh, personality trait that is linked to uh, creativity. So if you want to be a creative person, feel free to be disagreeable, neurotic, introverted or extroverted, but, oh, there's one now. Uh, and, uh, but openness to experience is the thing that, uh, that you want. Another thing that probably psychology students know about that I want to throw into this mix tonight is the idea of nature and nurture. It's one of the most fundamental ideas in all of psychology. Uh, and nature uh, generally re refers to things like heredity, biology, and nurture to everything that's learned or experienced. Uh, it's part of your uh, upbringing, your parents, your school, your culture, all of those kinds of things. The big question for uh, psychology always is when you're looking at something like creative genius, then how much of it is nature and how much of it is nurture? And it's always hard to tell and uh, we always say in psychology classes that it's an interaction between nature and nurture. That uh, you, you rarely find anything except maybe eye color or something like that that's all, uh, all nature. Oh, or all nurture, for that matter. Um, as I said, I, it's hard to tell what the balance is in any particular trait. I got a hint the last time I was here to give the evening lecture when uh, I was awarded for my efforts this T-shirt that said, Nature, nurture, either way, it's your parents' fault. <laughs> and Marissa tells me that there are still some of these for sale in some office. So uh, where would that be, Ann? <laughs> Psi Beta? Yeah, I don't think she, she, uh, she said there might be some, but... She, uh, she but oh, I shouldn't have mentioned it. Forget that, okay? But remember that it's your parents' fault. Now back to Steve Jobs for a moment. Oh, I should uh, tell you that he and I have one more thing in common. And that is that uh, both of us are Reed College dropouts. It took me... Um, a year to drop out of Reed College, whereas it took Steve Jobs only, only six months. So I guess I was the, the slow learner here. But I wanted to tell you something about uh, his uh, nature and nurture, whatever we know. You saw some of that in, the, in his presentation. On the biological, on the nature side, we know that he was a smart guy, his, uh, and we know that his father his biological father was probably a smart guy too. He was a professor, and as we know, all professors are pretty smart people, right? And uh, he was a political science professor at the University of Wisconsin, and his mother, a biological mother, was a, a speech therapy graduate student at the time. So probably he had some genes that were, uh, that helped him out in the smarts department. So um, biologically, that's about all we know on the, on the nature side. On the nurture side, as he said, he was an adopted kid. And uh, his biographer says that he's all, his parents were also quite supportive. Uh, 
they didn't have a highly educated background, but they made sure that he went to college, to read college. His uh, father got him started probably in, with an interest in electronics because his father liked to tinker with electronic stuff in the garage and uh, had fun inviting Steve to participate in his hobby as well. And then his interest continued into high school where he met another Steve, Steve Wozniak, uh, with whom he later started Apple Computers. So I think we can safely say that, say that uh, this is a kid that somehow nurture brought out some kind of um, geeky tendencies perhaps. And uh, he also had a certain amount of perseverance. Uh, but just as important is the larger culture in which he grew up. And that's something I think that's often overlooked when we talk about um, genius and creativity is the culture plays an important role. Uh, it was a time when he was born when computers were the size of rooms and they were capable of doing probably less than your cell phone can do today. It, uh, when he came of age, the internet was born. But telephones were still clunky things with curly cords on the ends. You may not realize if you're of typical college student age just how far this electronic revolution has brought us in a lifetime. In those early days, uh, authors like me and secretaries like some of you uh, laboriously manufactured manuscripts on typewriters. Uh, perhaps there are even some of you don't remember what, uh, don't know what typewriters were because they didn't exist during your lifetime. But Steve Jobs and, and uh, Steve Wozniak somehow realized that computers could do something, could do a lot of things that these typewriters and telephones and other devices could do and perhaps do it better. And so they jumped into the middle of the electronic revolution and changed the world. Their ideas, as I suggested, came from somewhere else and were integrated with their interest in electronics. Their creativity came out of what seems to be from, uh, to us, to be nowhere. Whoops. A second thing that Steve Jobs and I have in common is that he also seems to have a, an interest in Shakespeare, or had an interest in Shakespeare. Uh, Time Magazine once uh, ran an article in which they, uh, well, they put him on the cover, and inside there was an article saying, what were the 14 books that Steve Jobs liked the most? The 14 books that inspired Steve Jobs and the number one was not a book at all, it was King Lear by William Shakespeare. It's interesting to, I, I don't want to perpetrate too much psychology on Steve Jobs or William Shakespeare either, but it's interesting to just kind of speculate why would Steve Jobs like King Lear? And some of you may know it's a, it's a play about a king who was dying and who was trying to figure out how to divide up his empire. And uh, he didn't do it very successfully. And I'm sure Steve Jobs knew that he had an empire to divide up and to make sure that it was taken care of. And I suspect that that's the reason that was one of his, uh, the number one item on his list. Let's take a look now at, whoops, I don't right click. Oh, terrible mistake. 
I knew that I knew the technology would get me. I'll use this one. There's King Lear and some of his problems. Uh, let's turn to this guy. This is an actual photograph of William Shakespeare. Well, it's sort of an actual photograph of William Shakespeare. And uh, it's, um, it's hard to imagine anybody who is as different from William Shakespeare as Steve Jobs might be, you know, a technician, a, a guy that, uh, in Jobs' case, an electronics fellow. It's hard to imagine William Shakespeare being alive now and being really into computers. Uh, but uh, Shakespeare as a uh, literary genius. Well, before I tell you too much about him, tell me what you know. Anything you know about William Shakespeare? When was he born or when did he live? Give me a, an approximate number. 1600, somebody say you win the prize. Uh, he wrote, depending on how you count them, somewhere between 37 and 40 plays and a bunch of sonnets, things like that. Uh, anything else you know about Shakespeare? He's dead too. <laughs> yeah, he's dead too. You cheated, you remembered that from earlier. Okay. Well, let me give you the nature-nurture rundown on Shakespeare. Um, he was born in Stratford. You probably knew that, but we're just afraid to say. Stratford, England. It's about 100 miles, I think, uh, north, uh, maybe northwest of London. Um, other than Lear, do you remember any... Uh, any plays that he wrote, sing one or two of them out. Yeah, not sing, but. Hamlet, Macbeth, Julius Caesar. Okay, you win another prize. Great, anything, any other ones? Anybody's read, perhaps? Twelfth Night. Twelfth Night, okay, the good. Tempest. As You Like It. As You Like It. Othello. Othello, Othello. okay. I'm impressed. You guys, you guys are good. Okay. Um, his father, on the nature side, was John Shakespeare. Not too much is known about him, but he was a, a successful, more or less successful merchant. Um, sometimes successful and sometimes not. Uh, probably an intelligent man, but we don't have any record of that. The IQ testing industry was uh, in its infancy at the time or even less. Um, and speaking of even less, even less is known about his mother, uh, except that she came from a relatively wealthy family of landowners. Uh, there are no records to survive, um, su to suggest that anybody in Will's pedigree was especially creative or intellectual or had a talent for acting and writing or if they were, news hasn't come to Roseburg, Oregon, and I don't know anything about it. On the nurture side, um, I think we have to remember that he lived in the culture of the Elizabethan era, uh, which was during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, one of England's strongest and most revered monarchs, and it was a time of uh, great social upheaval as well. Uh, it was the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. And we'll come back to that when we talk a little bit more about uh, cultural influences on creativity and genius. But it was a time of the uh, Black Death or the bubonic plague which kept sweeping over London and all of the cities in Europe uh, and killing like a third of the population. It was a, a time when, of fear and anxiety. There was also a threat of war from Spain. But uh, most interesting uh, to me, I think, it was also a time uh, when there were a lot of famous folks alive, a lot of other people that probably qualify as creative geniuses. Uh, just to name a few, Galileo, uh, was born the same year as Shakespeare, but also Cervantes, 
who was um, arguably wrote the world's first novel uh, in Spain, and there was no record that Shakespeare and Cervantes uh, knew each other, or at least that I'm aware of. Also, Descartes uh, was um, a genius in logic and in mathematics. Francis Bacon was um, inventing the scientific method, and so on. A whole bunch of real famous people, and then the question is, why is that? And my answer w is going to be that there were some cultural factors at work that, uh, that caused that. As for Shakespeare's family, uh, the meager evidence we have, and we have almost nothing uh, about the man's life, but the meager evidence suggests that like Steve Jobs' family, Shakespeare's was also nurturing. And I say that primarily because he uh, felt, it seemed to feel very close and supportive to um, the oldest, uh, to, to one of his two younger sisters. Will was the oldest in the family, in case you're one of the psychologists, an uh, Adlerian like me, who worries about things like family position. Uh, Will was the oldest surviving child. He probably attended the local grammar school where he would have memorized passages from classical Greek and Roman works. At age 18, when he probably got out of the uh, local school, approximately that uh, at age 18, he married Anne Hathaway, a woman who was eight years older than he was. And historians suspect it may have something to do with the fact that she was pregnant at the time they eventually had three children of whom he apparently was very fond. About, after, uh, about eight years after his marriage, however, he, some say, abandoned his family, but he packed up his bags and went to London uh, and to seek his fortune. But we do know that he returned home at least occasionally, but it was a, a four hour or a four day ride each way. So it was not a daily commute, uh, that's for sure. But make a fortune he did. Uh, he retired a wealthy man, although he never published any of his plays. He did quite well though, because he was part owner of the uh, troupe that uh, owned the Globe Theater. And so he had a share in the profits from the plays and the, uh, he had incentive to write plays that would pack the seats, that would attract every possible person to the, to the theater. A couple of more facts uh, about Shakespeare, and this time I want to tell you what Shakespeare and I have in common. As you remember, Shakespeare and Steve Jobs, or she, uh, Steve Jobs and I shared some uh, characteristics. In uh, Shakespeare's case, we both drained a pint or two at this pub called the Anchor, which was one of the two or three pubs that were in existence uh, in Shakespeare's time. And it was quite a, a pilgrimage, I guess I would say, to, uh, to go to the Anchor Pub. And you may uh, see somebody sitting in the audience who was, also appears in that picture, my wife, Michelle. Uh, so uh, we both uh, hung out at the Anchor a little bit. And the second thing that the Bard and I have in common is, of course, we're both writers. Uh, some have said that Shakespeare took it to a different level than I did, but we were both writers. Um, he was called the Bard. Nobody's ever accused me of that. Now, you may be wondering what Bard stands for. It's uh, simply a Scottish Gaelic term meaning poet. So anybody who writes a poem can be a bard. So you can be a bard this evening if you like. But only Shakespeare can be the bard. What? <laughs>
I must confess, though, that Shakespeare and I have had a rocky relationship. As an educated person, I've always felt that I should like Shakespeare and his plays more than I did. But the language, for me, was always a big problem. And I don't know if it was for you. Anybody else have trouble with... Yeah, there were, there's one or two other people here that have had trouble. And it's 400 years old, and it was almost a different language. And it's hard work trying to go through Shakespeare's plays and look at the, at the glosses and uh, try to figure... It's just not an easy read the first time or two. Um, but I'm hoping that I can convince you that if you've struggled with it, that it's worth the effort to persevere. My English teachers always said, they always quoted Hamlet and said, the language should fall trippingly from the tongue. But instead I tripped over words like forsooth and anon and Sarah and all of those things. But I found out one afternoon when I was watching a Shakespeare play and kind of dozing off that the language was getting in the way of something that I found much more interesting. It occurred to me that Shakespeare was a psychologist too. A psychologist of sorts, not in the same sense that uh, Dr. Ewing is a psychologist, but in the, in the sense that he knew a lot about human behavior. And I'm going to argue that he actually anticipated many of the things that you're studying about in your general psych text. He didn't give them the same terms, but he knew the concepts. And that's the important thing. Well, except when you take the test, I suppose. Now, to be clear, I'm, I'm going to talk about Shakespeare's psychology, but I'm not going to try too much to, well, you might say psychoanalyze him because Sigmund Freud and a lot of other people have perpetrated that on Shakespeare way too much, I think. But instead, I want to focus on Shakespeare's understanding of psychology. And what did he himself conceive of human behavior and mental processes to be? So that's what, uh, what I want to dwell on for just a little bit. As you'll see, I'm not really alone in this. Whoops. Where did that come from? I'm looking for another slide. I'm looking for this one. We'll come back to... Or do you want to see Shakespeare some more? He has an attitude, you know. And maybe that's why I didn't get uh, along with him for, for a while. This guy doesn't look nearly so fierce. It's Harold Bloom, and he's a curmudgeonly old uh, uh, Shakespeare scholar. Uh, but he said of Shakespeare, he was a psychologist, an astute observer of human nature, human problems, personalities, and foibles. He was the quiet fellow at the bar, observing everyone else. So you can imagine what I did when I went to the, uh, the anchor. I fantasized that I was the quiet fellow at the bar, observing everyone else. And sure enough, I saw people there who could have been Hamlet, or could have been Iago, or could have been um, Dahl Tearsheet, or many of the others. I, I wanted to go up to some of them and say, do you know? But I restrained, no, Michelle restrained me. I'm going to take things a step farther than Harold Bloom did and say the following. In my humble opinion, Shakespeare owes his success as much to his psychology as to his cleverness with language. 
and I begged the forgiveness of Miss Turner, my English teacher, and the English professor we have in the audience. But bear with me. I think that I hope I can convince you that Shakespeare was a psychologist, and that that's one of the things that people really loved and continue to love about him. I'm going to base my argument on Shakespeare's own words, and I'll give you some examples of how he understood many psychological processes and, and mental disorders. And where better to begin than with the DSM? If you're a psychology student, you've probably heard of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition, the DSM-5. And Shakespeare knew about this too. He just didn't know what it was going to be called 400 years later. My proposal is that Shakespeare probably went to places like this. It's called St. Mary's of Bethlehem Hospital, or as the English are prone to condense words, uh, they called it Bedlam. And of course, we still use that uh, word uh, for loud noises and chaotic uh, situations. But in those days, uh, you could go to Bedlam and pay a shilling or two and go in and look at the mental patients as though they were animals in a zoo. You know, times were a bit different. And uh, life for mental patients was, uh, was pretty brutal, of course. And it wouldn't surprise me that Shakespeare might have taken a tour in Bedlam looking for characters just like he was looking for them in the Anchor Pub. So what did Shakespeare see in Bedlam? What kind of mental cases did he come up with? And I'm uh, suggesting to you that he might, he perhaps wrote his own DSM, or as I'm calling it, the DMS, the Diagnostic Manual of Shakespeare, because he, he found all of the following kinds of things. He described psychosis, and, but he called it madness and lunacy, and he described it in King Lear and Macbeth and other places. He described de depression, but he called it melancholy, but he described it in Hamlet, Pericles, King John, and other places. Obsessive compulsive disorder, the classic example of that, we'll come back to in a minute, but it's in uh, Lady Macbeth in the play of her husband's name. Personality disorders appear classically in a bunch of his plays. Richard III especially was a, what we would call an anti-social uh, personality or a psychopath, psychopathic personality. He's a a fellow that murdered his way to the English throne. He talked about dementia in King Lear. He talked about hysteria in King Lear. We now call it conversion disorder. Or did they rename that one? I think it's conversion disorder still. Dissociative identity disorder or what we might call um, multiple personality. But this is, I think, the uh, latest version, latest label, was uh, described, at least in passing, in Richard II. Post-traumatic stress disorder was seen in Titus Andronicus. Love that play. It's really nasty. Uh, epilepsy was described in Julius Caesar, and I don't mean to say if you have epilepsy that you're mentally disordered, but it is a disease of the brain. And uh, Julius Caesar apparently uh, historically uh, had it, but uh, Shakespeare also included it in, in the play by the same name. And he loves sleep disorders. He described them in, in Macbeth, Hamlet, Midsummer Night's Dream, The Tempest, and other places.
But let's uh, go back just for a moment to give you a, just a little bit more about obsessive compulsive disorder in Macbeth. Here you see Lady Macbeth and a doctor and a lady in waiting, but Lady Macbeth has uh, just participated in a murder. She'd helped her husband at her behest. She'd helped her husband to kill the king while he slept in their castle. And she got blood on her hands, a lot of blood, and she was trying to wash it off, and she couldn't wash it off. And so the, the passage goes, doctor, and the doctor said, what is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. And the lady in waiting says, it's an accustomed action with her to seem thus, washing her hands. I have known her continue this a quarter of an hour. And then the famous line from Macbeth, where Lady Macbeth says, out, damn spot, out I say. Yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Shakespeare obviously knew OCD, but he, of course, didn't call it that. He didn't give it a label. But he knew it. So I'm going to rest my case that Shakespeare knew something about mental illness. But his catalog of mental disorders is not the only psychology that uh, Shakespeare serves up. Now, of course, he didn't know Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud's dead, too. Who is, who's keeping track of that over here? Somebody. Uh, and you probably know, if you're a psych student, uh, a little bit about Sigmund Freud. But he, uh, I want to suggest that he anticipated some of the ideas that Freud had, particularly about ego defense mechanisms. Uh, today, we might call some of them cognitive biases or motivated reasoning or by some other um, labels. But let me give you just a couple of examples. Uh, first, from Julius Caesar. Uh, where uh, it's a play that you probably read in high school because it has absolutely no sex in it. It does have a lot of violence, but that doesn't seem to bother the uh, high school English teachers. And you may remember the plot. It, uh, Caesar has become a powerful general, and many people are worried that he's too powerful and will become a dictator. Cassius his former buddy, decides that the only solution is for the good of the country to assassinate him. And Cassius needs some help, so he tries to persuade Brutus to join the assassination plot. Brutus is hesitant, and Cassius is saying, man up. And so the famous line where Cassius says to Brutus, Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. One of the most famous lines in the play, and it illustrates what Freud would call denial, an ego defense mechanism. It's what happens, of course, when we put blame for our own faults on external factors. And again, for those of you who are psychology students, it's sort of the uh, fundamental attribution error turned upside down. So Brutus is blaming his lowly status on the stars. Nowadays, we might attribute it to bad luck or just say the coke slipped out of my hands and into my lap, or the devil made me do it, or, or something like that. I've heard Bill Ewing for example, say uh, when he shanked a shot out into the woods, stupid golf clubs, right? That's all the same ego, ego defense mechanism. And psychologists now call that the self-serving bias, the tendency to attribute undesirable outcomes to external factors, such as the stars, rather than to our own shortcomings. Uh, uh, one other example of uh, cognitive bias or ego defense comes from uh, my favorite Shakespeare play, which is Measure for Measure. Uh, 
And in it, it's, a, it's kind of a morality tale. The Duke has left this guy, Claudio, or Angelo, in charge. And the Duke disguises himself and pretends to leave town. But disguised as a priest, he comes back to see if people are behaving themselves uh, when he's not around. And sure enough, they're not. And in particular, it's Angelo here who has the power of being in charge going to his head. And he makes the town obey the strictest possible interpretation of the laws, including the law against fornication. Oh, I see I got somebody's experience, uh, attention. For, the, uh, for this crime, he sentences one Claudio to death, even though Claudio committed the crime with his fiance. But it gets worse. Angelo thinks he's above the law and he can commit fornication too and get away with it. Fornication with a nun who just happens to be Claudio's sister. So the plot gets thicker and Angelo gets in deeper and deeper and here is a line that the nun Isabella says, but man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence, like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as make the angels weep. I'll give you a quick translation of that. Give a proud man a little authority and he will make himself too, he will, it will make him too sure of himself. With his fragile mind, his glassy essence, more like an ape than a man, he will hold the strongest opinions about things which he is, about which he is least informed. He will likely commit outrageous deeds that will make even the angels weep or cry. Now focus on that line, most ignorant of what he's most assured. That's the, uh, what the psychologists would call the overconfidence effect. And sometimes it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which has been evoked in, uh, by um, reporters in recent weeks. I won't get too much into politics, but I'll just let you use your imagination. The uh, Dunning-Kruger effect was named after two social scientists uh, who first studied it, and they were inspired by a man who robbed a bank after covering his face with lemon juice in the mistaken belief that because lemon juice could serve as invisible ink, it would prevent his face from being recognized and recorded on surveillance cameras. That's the Dunning-Kruger effect. And maybe you know somebody uh, who uh, fits that bill. Make your own connections, okay. Those are two examples of uh, what I think are pretty sophisticated uh, cognitive biases and ego defenses that occurred 400 years ago in Shakespeare's mind, and he described them. But I would suggest to you that these cognitive uh, insights abound in, in Shakespeare's work. Insights that psychology wouldn't even begin to describe for at least 200 or 300 years. I'm going to list, just briefly list a few others that he uh, also understood. He understood a priming effect, which you'll find in Othello. He understood the 